and bars. Oh wow. Looks wonderful. Looks so It's a great <coughs> it's a great color. It's like between red. Wow, it's a fabulous orange. color. It's cri like crimson. Crim crim crimson. Crins. Crinsman. Well, I'm lucky. I, I, you look a thousand times better than on that Disney tape. Well, of course, you're thinner and everything. You look 20 years younger. Than from what? Than from that, those Disney tapes. Who? The Disney tapes. The, the I weighed 205 Harden, pounds yeah, on the Harden Disney Mandel, tape. Yeah, uh, Mandel reminisces and whatever that it was. I'm 35 pounds lighter. You want to talk? I bit. want you to know that you're not audible from where you are. Oh, okay, I'm going to lean up then. Okay. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what your favorite Martin and Lewis film was. Uh, tell, can you tell me before we roll what, which one we're going to talk about? I don't have to tell you anything. <laughs> I'm hoping it's The Stooge <laughs> because of the, your shenanigans in the theater. It was know? exactly The Stooge. I had a feeling, okay. I didn't know, I just kind of guessed. I kind of guessed. So, if you can start. Just let me know if you're gonna roll. Yeah, I will. I wanna start by your making that statement that that if was If you speak up, point. then I'll answer you. Uh, I wanna start, can you hear me now? No. You can't, shit. Um, yes, yes, Carol, go ahead. Um, I want to start by your making that statement that The Stooge was your favorite Martin and Lewis film and why, and talk about the theater and how your experience in the theater. Why don't you ask me when we're rolling? We are. I will. Was used to do the, to portray what you portrayed in The Stooge, that character. Well, that's kind of simplistic. We used a theater that was on stage six at Paramount that had facades here, facades there. There was a stage light, le left facade, stage right facade. We had a box that was stage left and a box stage right. And um, in the opening shots of the film, the kid was in the stage right or audience left box. In the completion of the film, I was in the stage left audience right box. Uh, <clears throat> but the reason that the film was so significant was because I think that we both knew psychologically we were going to have to meet that day where the split would happen. So the Stooge was very emotionally traumatic for me because I knew we were predicting what was ultimately going to happen. I don't think that Dean was aware of it as much as I was. So I took the film as a very, very passionate and emotional project. And you, do you remember feeling that? Oh yes, that of course. Voting? Of course. The greatest fear in the world is when you make any kind of y unity. It's the same fear a man has with a wife. They go through that seven year itch and his fear is will he lose her. Her fear is will she lose him. When How Dean and I made The Stooge, we were already together about uh, six years. So we were <clears throat> beginning to get those psychological traumas developing in our subconscious. And were the things like your sewing the buttons on for him in the dressing room, were those things derived from what you, what you really did? Or no, what? no. That was scripted material by the writer. Not by you? No. I had nothing to do with that film. That was uh, written by uh, Marty Rackin and Ed L. Rod, and they were, they were uh, wonderful writers. And we did, we were very, very dedicated to the script, and we played the script totally. Okay. Now, tell me about who taught you how to do those falls on stage that you used to do, that you did for years, over and over and over again. Who taught me what? Who taught you how to fall? My father. And how did he do that? He was very good. He was perfect. I told you earlier that he would go from singing a song and wiping out all the women in the audience to a wild hat and take pratfalls and, and the, the, the very nature of his 
artistic ability was that he did these things and made them look so simple. When you do crab falls, when you used to do all those falls, including things like when Dean would just drop you, mm -hmm. did it did it hurt a lot of the time? Or yeah. Did? Yeah. I got up at uh, 6 this morning, and at uh, 10 after 6, I was able to get one leg off the bed. I've been doing that for 35 years. Um, you pay for those Pratt Falls. You do them for 64 years, you're going to pay for them. I haven't had a day without pain in 35 years. But you learn to live with it. And there's other people that have worse than I have. Um, when, when you used to do the telethon many, many years ago, People love those falls so much. I, I, I always think of them as falling for dollars. People used to call up and you'd fall for $50 for the no, call, you're, for MDA. You're reading more into it than it I was. I don't know. I was a kid. I remembered that. They were calling you? in to see Jerry get crazy. Much of it was taking falls. I took one before. I got a good laugh. Dean would look at you like sometimes he was afraid you weren't going to get up. Well, I used to lay out and I was absolutely suspended before I would drop. They were great falls. They I got all great. of the bones and all of the pains to prove it. They were the greatest falls. What, did you get so into falling on stage when you were doing like the comedy hour stuff and you would fall through the set? Mm -hmm. Did you sometimes just kind of lose it and just like go for it? I mean, just You have to go for it. If you're tentative, you get hurt. If you're not aggressive, it won't work. If it looks like you prepared it, it won't work. Can you tell me about the bad fall? The fall that the bad you falls? took on stage? No, the one that, that you took in 65. Well, in 65, I took a fall off a piano at the Sands Hotel closing night. It was March 20th. Uh, we have in theater and in, uh, in nightclubs the very thing that's laying over there. It's called a cannon plug. It's a steel connector that goes from one wire to another, and it locks in with a little guide at the top. And on the floor of the stage was our mic cable that wasn't tabbed from the wing as it should have been. And I took this uh, double header off the piano, which made me 12 feet in the air from my head. And I came down and landed on my spinal column on that cannon plug. I knew I was in trouble because uh, trauma sets in immediately. I got up and I finished the show. I only had another five minutes to do. But when I got to the dressing room, I felt total paralysis in my, my lower exterior, uh, extremities, rather. So on March 21st, I was at UCLA at the orthopedic specialist. and. Uh, he told me that I chipped a piece of the spinal column off and that I will pay for it. <clears throat> and he gave me a calendar of events that in five years I would feel it more on the left side of my back. In five years from then I would get it in the lower back. Maybe five years after that I'd start getting it on the other side. And then in ten years from then it would be in my hands. Well, it started in my hands uh, in October of last year. And, of course, the only thing down the line is surgery. And that will only limit some of the pain. But I don't think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not interested in having a knife put in my spine. So I'll just, I'll just go through this hero-like Herculean day by day, giving pleasure to the masses as I suffer into my death. But initially, they gave you Percodan. Yes, they, they prescribed Percodan, but they prescribed one a day. I was up to 13 a day after seven years. And That's when I became addicted. And what did you do for that? Did you, did you end up having to go into a, into a clinic to... to uh, Dr. DeBakeme took me into, into a clean-out, put me out for 44 days. And when I awoke, I awoke reborn. Cleaned me out perfectly. 
and I've never taken anything but maybe an Advil since then. That was 1978 when I got cleaned up. But when you're at 13 Percodan a day, as I was, I can't tell you anything that happened between 1974 and 1978. That five years is dead in my brain. I have no idea. I'm told I did a couple of films, five telethons. I appeared in France, Germany, Holland. I did concerts in Australia and Japan. I have no recollection of any of that. But it's in my itineraries. My staff tells me I was there and that I did it. And that I worked in 1975, I worked 52 weeks out of 52. And in 1976, I worked 49 weeks out of 50. I, I don't remember any of it. Joey said you were a different person. Yes, you can be a different person if you're on dope. You are a different person. Now I'm back to the wonderfully warm, svelte, gorgeous, adorable Jew that most everyone adores. The other, th <laughs> the other thing that's happened is that, that uh, and this is just what people are telling me, uh, that you've made peace with the critics. Now, you really haven't made peace with the critics, have you? I mean. Made when peace you, with the critics? Yeah, Joe says, <clears throat> you know, I used to take Jerry over to the studios, and boy, he, he had always given them such a hard time. And I said, well, Joe, how could, how could you ever turn out a great film if you didn't give some of these people a hard time? I mean, it, one is contradictory to the other. Um, he said, oh, well, it's much better now. You know, he's making peace with them. And I said, I said to him, do you think I made really peace with should? the critics because I meant to focus on damn Yankees. My focus was to lose 35 pounds, learn the book, learn the songs, and make nice with the press because I meant to make this project successful. Sure. But you never really... I didn't finish. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. The only piece I made with the press is I did what they did. I became a whore. They've been doing it for uh, 100 years. So I'm just giving a taste of their own medicine, and I'm getting all of the press I need. I didn't make peace with them. I still think of them as I always did. They're whores, and they always will be. But as long as I want their space, I'll be so sweet and kind and loving, and I'll get all the space I want. I'm just doing to them what they've done to everybody else. Uh, OK. My favorite thing I ever saw you do on a stage with Sammy Davis was the routine where he jumps into your arms. You're not going to tell the joke, are you, and no. then ask me about it? No, I'm going to ask you something else, because I'm going to have the joke on tape okay. itself. I'm going to ask you how you feel about the fact that by today's standards, that would be, you know, kind of uh, politically incorrect. How, how were you and Sammy beyond all that bullshit? I mean, you, you did that routine, and I, I just, can't imagine anybody, you, any two people, any white man, black man ever doing that routine. Sammy and I were friends for 45 years, and the reason that we, we were the kind of Damon and Pythias friendship, closer than any man and wife, closer than any two friends could ever be, the reason we were that way was because we didn't take ourselves too seriously. And we made jokes and humor about the stupidity of ignorance and the stupidity of racism. We had the best time laughing at all of that crap. I said to him, when he converted to Judaism, I said, you didn't have enough trouble being black? Jesus Christ, I mean, you got a death witch? You're black and you want to be a Jew also? I said, all we have to do is have a car accident and you lose one eye, and sure enough. Yeah, the, the Ciro's, when he, when he lost the eye, that was a long time ago. Um, I know, I was there the night of the accident. Were you really? Mm-hmm. There were a lot of rumors about why that happened. It was a very honest, very straightforward accident. He was driving straight, and a car hit him head on. No reason, no nothing. He was on his way to Los Angeles, felt like driving to relax, and he was hit by an uncom on an oncoming car. And he was lucky he was alive, but he lost his eye. How long ago was that after you met him, that he had the accident? Oh, we had been friends about 10 years already. It happened around, oh, 56, something like that. I didn't realize like it was that late. Yeah. I did not know that. Okay. I sent him watermelon and Kentucky Fried Chicken in the hospital so he'd be comfortable. 
and matzah. When you and Dean would go out and do those Paramount shows in between the, the showings of the movie, mm -hmm. um, can you describe how you would hit that stage, how, how you did that when you did those eight shows a day? The movie would go off and then what would happen? Would orchestra would come up, audience? stage would come up with the orchestra, the orchestra plays a theme song. We'd have an opening act that did three minutes because that's all the time we had. An eccentric dance team, and they opened the show. And then I was introduced. <clears throat> I would do five minutes, then introduce my partner. He'd come out and sing two songs, and then the two of us would finish the hour, or hour and 10. And we did uh, 56 shows a week, 112 shows in two weeks at the Paramount then went to the Chicago Theater and did nine a day for 63 shows. So in the three weeks, we did 175 shows. Now they come to me here on Broadway and say, how are you gonna handle these eight grueling shows a week? Ha, ha. So I said, Jesus Christ, I did 56 a week. So the guy said, well, you were only 20 then. I said, well, I'm 69 now. They cut it down to eight. I think that works out. Was it the same as when you were on the, the bill, what was it, in 45 or 46 when you, when you were playing in between the showings of National Velvet when you were on a, was it, how different was it? When, was it? That was in 45 at Low State. Right. No, that was vaudeville, straight vaudeville. Mm -hmm. But it was the same principle, wasn't it? The movie would come up and then the act. That was vaudeville, movie, movie, movie vaudeville house. Low State had it, Paramount, the Capitol, the Strand, the Roxy. But when you did it with Dean, it became something else. It became pandemonium, right? Well, when Dean and I did it, anywhere I was, it was pandemonium. Exactly. Yeah. How, how much would you be able to change um, an act if you did that many shows a day? I mean, Very, very easy. He was so brilliantly attuned to everything that I did that I could go anywhere, and he'd be there with me. And we always had the foundation settled in our brains. We'd always go back if we got in trouble. I'm going to confine this, this interview. I only have a couple more questions just to being on the stage. Anything that, that, we, that you want to talk about, when I, I have one more question. And then when I see you at a later point, we will talk about your films, and we will use a blue screen, and we'll think about what you really want to say about making Cinder Fell on. Because I don't think this is an appropriate atmosphere. No, Or the no. other one to talk about Cinder Fell or any of those things. That's why I'm, I'm staying away from your soul. That film. should be at my typewriter. Huh? That should be at my typewriter. Right, okay. If that's what you want, fine. Okay, tell me when you first went on the stage and you did Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? Yeah. Um, was it like this? Have, did, how, how did you get on? I mean, did they? Did your father say, "Here, go this"? I mean, how, how does that happen when you're five years old? I think you were five, you said. My recollection, and the only reason that I remember it so well, is most five-year-olds don't wear a tux. Most five-year-olds don't walk out in front of maybe say six, seven hundred people on a Saturday night at the Swan Lake Hotel, uh, Stevensville Lake Hotel in Swan Lake, New York, the Catskill Mountains. Their theaters there were flat houses, what we call flat house. This is a theater with gradations in it for seating. A casino in the Borscht Belt was a flat house. Wooden chairs just put one behind one another. The stage was a very nice stage. It would be a proscenium probably uh, one third this size. Uh, there was an orchestra pit for the six musicians, fife and drum. Six musicians, fife and drum. I get it. And uh, I only remember my dad coming to the stage left wing and grabbing my hand, taking me to the center of the stage. I sang, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? And when I was supposed to take my bow, my foot slipped and it fell into the footlight and it exploded. It scared me half to death, and the audience laughed, and I heard myself get my first laugh from an audience. And I liked the laugh I got better than the applause I got. 
And that's why I'm here today, this crazy 69-year-old wacko. Can you hear me okay? Oh, my um, God, Sidney uh, Portier. I didn't know he came into town. All right. Now, just one last thing. We probably will see if we ever use it. I find that it's quite remarkable that after all the great films that you've made, that your favorite thing, in at least to my, correct me if I'm wrong, is filming this wonderful little daughter. With all of the, the tasks that you could put your talent to, you seem to concentrate on this baby, on muscular dystrophy. Is that, is that anything about the fact that you feel you're entitled to give your talent to what pleases you the most? I didn't hear you. I didn't hear the last part, what'd you say? Does that have anything to do with the fact that at this point in your life, you want to, you feel that you have a right to devote your talent to the, the object that pleases you the most? Danny, mm -hmm. of course, I've earned that right. I earned the right the day I was born. They gave me the pink slip on me. I can do any goddamn thing I want. The choices I have made through my, my life, I have no regrets about. I think they were right on and I'll continue to make them. The choice in having a daughter at this time in my life was the right one. What I didn't know before I had Danny was that I didn't have any air in my lungs. I was going on some synthetic something. Since Danny, I have air in my lungs. My heart beats better. Everything that I do is better. She's a miracle baby, and she should have my total, complete focus. She allows me to come to the theater at night to do the show, so it's okay. If she said no, I'd never be here. And she goes everywhere with you. She goes everywhere. And how much footage would you say you've shot of Danny as of How today? much have I shot of Danny? Yeah. She will never live to be old enough to run at all. If Danny was gonna be a 94-year-old lady, she will still have 37 hours to run. That's how much I've shot of her so far. Notwithstanding stills. Okay. It's only appropriate. Ah, let's see, what else, what else? I had a hidden camera in the nursery so I could see the first time she peed. I got beautiful shots of her. Head on, side shot, from up in the bowl, it's beautiful. Most adorable pishy you ever saw in your life. You've always had those cameras. Oh, yes. I use them for other things. That's what makes Sam so happy. <laughs> Years ago, you had, you had cameras in your home when, you're, when your other children were growing up. That was right? just, those were just video cameras to make sure they were okay. Uh -huh. Well, the video assistant. The That's video later. assist That's we'll do in another. Right. We don't want to talk about the video assist here. Um, I know. This is it. Um, can you tell me about what it felt like in the gut the first time you stepped on that stage alone without Dean when you filled in for Judy Garland? I, I don't mean the event. The event I can do. But the experience of being on a stage by yourself. What, what, how did, first of all, how did you get the guts to do it? What did it feel like? Well, guts I've always had. You do what you have to do. But the only way I can describe the fear is you have to try to pull your top lip over your head to get some idea of what the fear was like. Then to walk out with that fear and see what you could do after being with a partner for 10 years and everything we did was pretty well regimented. I had no idea what I was gonna do and before I knew it, I had done 45 minutes. And I was, uh, it was as good a show as I've ever done in my life, but I couldn't tell you what I did. But I was out there 45 minutes and then I said to the conductor, Buddy Breckman was conducting, and remember, I was a substitute because Judy Garland got a bad laryngitis that night and they asked me to come over and because Judy and I were friends I said sure when I got there I didn't know what the hell I was going to do yeah. Dean and I had only split up three weeks before so I said to the conductor I said how does Judy get off when she finishes her act he said she sings rockabye I said play it I sang it 
stopped the show cold, and I was in a recording studio three days later. I made Rockabye, and it sold over seven million copies. And all those people who said don't sing. Yes, all those people that said don't sing, right. <laughs> all, those col all those people in the columns. Well, people in the columns are the same people we talked about before. Exactly. Is it? Is like it Liz Smith, we're seriously thinking about doing a benefit where we could have Liz Smith put to sleep in the presence of an entire audience, just on stage, you know, how they put away a criminal for killing someone. We just put her to sleep nicely. Is it, <laughs> it do, you, do you start to get, do you start to get panicky? I mean, when, what, what does it feel like? Do you, do you, do you, does your heart start to beat? Do you just space out? I mean, if you really want to know what it's like, meet me here. <laughs> At five minutes after eight tonight, I'll show you exactly what it feels like. You I have to be prepared to walk I, with I, me, I though. Never, I did it as a kid, and I never wanted to keep throwing up, and so I stopped. I stopped throwing up. Does it ever get any easier? Does it ever get easier? Yeah, to it's, get it, yourself it's, up and <coughs> It's not that difficult. There's nothing difficult about it. The only thing that makes it appear difficult is that you carry a very, very big responsibility. You have a lot of people out there who come for a reason. They don't come because you're neurotic. They don't come because you're of your need to do what you do in front of them. They don't come because there's some underlying psychological hang up in your life. They come to be entertained. Your responsibility is to go out there and sweat. If you do less than sweat, then you're cheating them. If you're not dedicated to what you do, you will not have responsibility and you'll not show up. And if you do show up, you'll dog it and not give a crap. Did you only have the panic that night? I mean, after the night filling in for Judy Garland, was it over then? It or was you over. still Miss Dean for, for, for a long time? It was over. Yeah. I had the same panic opening night in Damn Yankees. I had what I, I wouldn't call it panic because I was, I was strangely resolved to I was finally getting to do what I wanted to do for over 60 years. I was calm, but that's what troubled me, that I was calm. So what I think I was, was that I was so petrified that I got calm. That's what I think happened. Right. So but when I came up on that elevator, the first shot, and they applauded, and I heard my father's voice, now you got it, kid, I was home. When you did the, your, your solo television shows after the breakup was been, mm -hmm. if you look at them and you look at the ones before, you can see the changes in you. you oh, can... sure. Well, when Dean and I split up, I was 30. Those shows, I was already into 40. And in 45 years, you start to get a little wisdom. At 50, you're smarter. At 60, you're really bright. And at 69, you're borderline brilliant. But you have to go through the calendar to get there. Did, did, when you did those shows by yourself and you would sing, I'll go my way by myself, what was that? Was that was that for you, or was that to send a me I mean, send a message to the audience? Why did you choose? It was those a very songs? good theatrical song. They had seen me for ten years with an, another man, and when I wrapped up a two and a half hour, one man show, the best song that I could possibly find was "I'll Go My Way by Myself," and it was dramatically effective, and it was effective theatrically, and it was a good piece of material. That's why I did it. I just have one other question. You always have one other question. 